This video is an introduction to perennials. They're probably my favorite plant. I'll explain how they grow, how to take care of them, and then I'll give you some insights into selecting the perfect perennial for your garden. This video was shot during a course I gave at the local university, so the format's a little different than my usual videos. I hope you enjoy it. Tonight we're going to talk about perennials. To start with, the word perennial and herbaceous are interchangeable. So us commoners, we call them perennials. The scientific people call them herbaceous. Some people put the two together and call them herbaceous perennials. And I thought the best way to really understand a plant is to look at what it does throughout its life. So I put this little table together. We start out with seeds germinating. And believe it or not, that surprises people. But every perennial you have in your garden, everything you see in a nursery did come from seeds at some point. The ones in the nursery may have been propagated a different way, but at some point they were seeds and they germinated. That generally happens in the spring. The seeds grow roots, they grow leaves, the little thing starts to grow. As soon as it makes leaves, it gets light, so it photosynthesizes, which makes food for the plant. It uses that food to grow more. The most first summer, for most perennials, not much happens. Uh, you get a bunch of leaves, and that's pretty much all. Fall comes, and the top dies down, so all the green stuff goes brown and disappears, or is laying on the ground. As it's going brown, it actually takes the nutrients from those leaves and moves it down into the roots. So a perennial, if it's going to make it through the winter, has to put extra food in the roots, and that's where it stores it. That's where all the growth for next spring is going to come from. The leaves dying back is an important process, and the plant actually takes all the nutrients and carbohydrates and sugars and everything else that's in the leaves as much as possible and moves it down into the roots. And that's why a lot of those leaves go from green to yellow, because it stops photosynthesizing and sucks all the good stuff out of them. In the winter, it rests. Not much happens. In the spring, it all starts up again. It starts to grow makes roots, makes leaves, and sometimes during that summertime it will flower. For some perennials, this can be extended into several years. Something like a trillium, for instance, if we planted some seeds this spring, it will be five to seven years before it flowers. Some perennials are quite slow. Many of them will take two years. Some of them will flower the first year, but very rarely. Usually it's a two-year process. So the second year it starts to grow, and in summer it flowers. The purpose of those flowers, of course, is to make more seeds. And in the fall it dies back, and then in the winter it rests. And from then on that cycle simply repeats. Growth, flower, die back, and rest. And a true perennial will do this for a very long period of time. Now let's compare that to an annual. And for those who didn't memorize that chart, it's at the bottom here. And what I've done is highlighted the areas that are different so we don't have to repeat everything. An annual is quite different. It starts out the same way, starts with a seed, it grows, it flowers the first year, and then it dies. And that plant is programmed to do that. I'm assuming that this annual that we're talking about is, is an annual in nature, and it's designed to do this. So it, it doesn't actually send much food to the roots because, hey, it's not going to be around here next year. It doesn't need roots. It only needs roots early on to get going here. So none of this food is, is taken away. But flowering is a very energy-intensive process. It's, it's the most energy-intensive thing the plant can do. And it kind of sucks the life out of this plant. It puts everything into flowering to make seeds so it propagates. Well, now we have something called a short-lived perennial. So the first part of it is all the same, except after it flowers, it dies. The interesting thing about short-lived perennials is that if you go to your nursery or you go to the library and get a book on perennials, there is no such thing as a short-lived perennial until you put money down and buy them and take them home. And suddenly you realize there's a whole bunch of short-lived perennials. And they're short-lived for a bunch of different reasons. Sometimes in nature, they're just programmed this way. They're, they just don't last very long. A lot of times this has to do with culture. For instance, when I started my garden, I went out and bought pretty much anything I could find. 
I bought lots of Coreopsis, nice yellow flowering and red flowering and striped ones. Most of them are really short-lived. They don't come back. There are other Coreopsis, which I've had in the gardens for 10 years, and they come back every year. They're all perennials. They're all in the perennial section of the nursery. They're all in the book under perennials, but they don't come back. And you can go and talk to people all across Canada, and they all tell you the same thing. Those perennials just don't come back. There are other kinds of perennials that do that here, but don't do that somewhere else. It could be the temperatures that we have in the wintertime. It could be the amount of wet we have. We're a very wet winter province here. Right? So if you go to Edmonton, it's colder, but it's very dry. And many plants actually survive better out there than here. Go to Montreal, and it's a little colder, but Montreal gets more snow. So the ground gets covered in snow, and those plants are protected underneath the snow. So in fact, they can grow things that we can't grow here. So there are things that are short-term perennials, but you'll never see that label anywhere. The reason why this is important is that you as a gardener, you go out and buy this plant, you bring it home and it dies, it doesn't come back. And you're wondering, what the heck did I do wrong? And it may just be that plant in this location. Okay, you can't blame yourself for everything that doesn't work in the garden. So there's also something called biannuals or monocarpic. These two terms are sort of interchangeable. It's kind of like a short-lived perennial. It does its thing, it flowers, and then dies. The difference with this one is that it's genetically programmed to do this, and it does it pretty much everywhere. So a classic example is the foxglove. Foxglove makes these beautiful flowers late in the summer, and, and then it pretty much dies. The first year's growth is no higher than this. It just makes some leaves. It looks like a dandelion almost sticks right on the ground, the leaves come out and just sits there. And that's what it does the first year. You don't even notice it. Then the second year, it gets a little taller and it makes this big flower spike up. And then it's, it's programmed to, to die. Interesting thing about foxgloves is that they actually will sometimes come back the third year, but they're really biannual. So, so scientists consider them biannuals and only think they're going to do that that once. Another one is the hen and chicks, which you might know, which is a little rock garden plant. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, makes little babies all the way around. And you're thinking, wow, it's just getting nice and big. It's really beautiful. And then it starts flowering and you go, wow, I got flowers. Well, the minute it makes that flower spike, it's dying. And not the babies, but the mother plant is on its way out. And in fact, it starts dying before it even makes the flower spike. And there are quite a few plants like that, particularly alpine type plants that that flower signals the, the plant to die. One of the cl classic ones for this area are lupins. Okay, so lupins typically make nice blue flowers. They're, they're part of the pea family. People here have a hard time growing lupins, and I never really have. I'm, I'm not sure why people in Guelph can't grow lupins, but, but what does happen is they're short-lived, and they rarely will live three years. Okay, two years, good, three years, maybe, four years, almost never and they die. Yeah, you can go out to Nova Scotia, and they're, they're a weed out there. They grow everywhere. You can go up to the Arctic and the Northwest Territories, and they grow everywhere. And they're perennials. They're long-lived perennials. But for some reason, not here. So one of the interesting things that happens is you go out and you buy all these fancy colors. They're reds and yellows and bicolors and all kinds of beautiful ones. You put them in your garden. You enjoy them for a year or two. And then they seem to die, and then they, they kind of seem to come back again. And then you got a couple here and there, but they're all blue because they're all from seed. Right? And people are always very confused. I planted red ones. How come they're all blue now? Well, they come back from seed, but they go back looking like their ancestors, and they're all blue. Lupins in nature, I'm not sure if there are red ones. I don't know where the color comes from, but you almost always see blue ones. All right, trees and shrubs. So how do they differ? Well, they're pretty much the same thing. Believe it or not, all trees and shrubs come from seeds. They grow leaves, pretty much the same as perennials. But then something different happens in the fall. That stuff above the ground, the stems, the trunk, becomes hard and woody. And the tree actually goes through a different process. So somewhere around August 1st, as the days get shorter, it says to itself, geez, I have to get ready for winter does that by changing some of its internal biochemistry and it what we call hardens off the wood so the wood actually changes 
So if you look at a uh, tree or shrub and you look at it, say, in a month from now and look at the growth, it's very green. Very, it looks almost like a perennial. You can bend it. It's, it's very fleshy. In the middle of summer, it gets a little harder. We call it semi-hardwood. And then by fall, it's hardwood. It's, it, you can hardly bend the thing. So it goes through this process and perennials don't. The big difference between perennials and trees and shrubs is the way they treat their above ground growths. The one aborts it and says, I don't need it. Take all that energy and put it into roots underground. And the trees and shrubs say, I need that stuff up there. And I'm going to leave a lot of my food up in the trees. Now we have something called subshrubs. I told you it was going to get a little more complicated. Subshrub is something that people just don't understand because all of the garden writers have gone out of their way to confuse you. And the nurseries have gone out of their way to confuse you. So you might know what lavender is or Russian sage. In fact, most of the sages are like that. We think they're perennials. When we go to the nursery, we buy them in the perennial section. When we look them up on, on the internet in a book, they're perennials. Well, they're not. They're actually shrubs. And once you understand that and you treat them like shrubs, you stop killing them. Because what people tend to do with their lavender this time of year is they cut it right to the ground. That's what you do with perennials. Anything that's left above ground this time of year, you cut it off. And that's a really good way to kill your subshrubs. If we look at what they do is they're trees. We call them subshrubs. And in fact, there's no real good definition for subshrubs except that it's a short shrub. It doesn't actually have a different definition. So exactly what is sub and what is a shrub? Well, it's kind of up to you. But generally, sub shrubs are under two feet and shrubs are a little taller. But you'll see they grow exactly the same way. The tops become woody. And that's the secret to lavender. This top gets woody. And if we cut it right to the ground, it's like many trees. They die. Uh, lavender, by the way, what you do is you don't do anything. You don't do anything in the fall and you don't do anything in the spring. Because lavender actually comes out fairly late, and I wait until I see the new buds, and then I know how far back I can cut it. And if I cut above the new buds, it will grow. Once we understand they're shrubs, then they're really easy to take care of. Back to the perennial. Everything that has to do with culture for perennials relies on this. We have to understand this process, and then taking care of perennials is really easy. One of the things I find in horticulture is that we... We like to learn about each plant. So there's, there's books of perennials, and they have 500 perennials in there. And there's a page for each one, and on each one it tells you how to take care of that perennial. And that never made a lot of sense to me because we want to treat them all the same way. You know, who can remember 500 different cultural procedures? Understand this. When it's growing and making leaves, it's making food for the plant. That food will either end up in the roots to make a bigger plant, or it's used for flowers and making seeds. But we may not want those seeds. Making seeds is also a very energy-intensive process for the plant. we got to think about these seeds that it's going to make, because I'd rather have that energy go into the roots and make the plant bigger rather than go into the seeds. The other thing is that this leaf growth is really important for feeding the plant, for making bigger plants next year. So everything I do should be towards keeping those leaves. And I find a lot of people, the minute a leaf gets a little damaged or it has a little blemish or some bug has chewed a little bit off of it, they pick it off the plant. Well, what you're doing is you're taking away the plant's ability to make food. And if you keep doing that, it gets smaller every year. So we don't want to do that. Anything that's green on a plant stays on the plant. So wood is a good perennial because there are, there are many to choose from. So we might as well pick a good perennial. This is kind of a personal choice to some extent, but I think there's some things we, we can all agree on. This is probably my all-time favorite perfect perennial. So what do I want out of a perennial? Zero work. I want to plant it and forget it. It shouldn't need a lot of water. It shouldn't need a lot of fertilizer. I don't want to take care of it. I don't want to cut it back. I want it to bloom all summer long. I want it to look neat, whatever that means. And we all have our own personal taste of what looks neat. But this plant makes a nice clump. It looks like this all year long. It has fall color, so the leaves will turn nice reds in the fall. 
it flowers for most of the year. And you know what? There's never a weed underneath it because it's so thick. It makes a nice thick clump. So it just covers everything. You never weed this thing. So you can plant it and forget it. It does get a little bigger every year, but not a lot. So it's adding, you know, a couple of inches every year. Maybe after seven years, you might want to chop it up into smaller chunks and give some away. It's the perfect perennial. It even comes in different colors. So this is a common color. Name is a geranium sanguineum. Perfectly hardy here. So that's the other thing we like. We like it to come back. The flowering all summer is rare. Perennials typically flower two weeks and they're done. That's the problem with perennials. And that's why a lot of people like growing annuals because they flower all summer long. Okay, the blood root. If we don't get any rain and we have perfect weather, uh, you barely get a week out of that thing. Another one at home, which is an Ontario native twin leaf, and I uh, said no rain, perfect weather, maybe two days, that's it, then the flower's gone. Geraniums that people buy in the nurseries, you know, the red ones and the pink ones that everyone always buys, those aren't geraniums. Okay? They're not hardy and they're not geraniums. A true geranium is a, is a plant more like this, and most geraniums are hardy here, and there's hundreds of them for you to choose from. So the red things we buy are pelargoniums. For some reason, everyone thinks they're geraniums, and we're not going to change that. The other thing we have to know about culture is what that plant really likes to grow in. And there's a bunch of different things we can consider. So this, again, is a picture of my place. And you can see this very shady garden here. So if you were planting that, you might say, well, I need a, a plant that really likes the shade. It turns out that this is actually a really sunny spot. It only looks this way because I went out at the right time of the day, which is around noon, and took the picture. It just happens to be underneath a bunch of sugar maples here, and right around noon, I can get a lot of shadow there. But anything six hours or more, we consider full sun, so this is certainly a full sun place. Plants are classified according to the amount of light they like. And some people kind of go overboard on this. Turns out perennials are not as fussy as people think. So you can grow sun-loving plants in shade, shade-loving plants in sun, and sometimes they do better where they're not supposed to be. Uh, many times if you take a, a sun-loving plant and put it in too much shade, it grows fine, but it gets less flowers. If you take a shady plant and put it in sun, it may be stunted, so it'll be smaller. It usually flowers fine. It may need more water. So water and shade go together. Things that we talk about being shady plants, a lot of times what they really want is more water, and there's more water in the shade than in the sun. The classic example is the hosta. probably know what a hosta is, and you know it's great for shade. If you go to nursery, that's what everyone recommends. You want something for shade, dry shade, here, have a hosta. And they do just fine there. But where does a hosta grow in nature? Full sun, right beside the river. Now we're talking green hostas, not these fancy ones, right? So the ones with a lot of light colored leaves, they can't take quite as much sun. But the real hosta, the green hosta, is a full sun plant, but it's always wet. People have heard now, well, geez, hostas grow in sun too, and so they take these poor hostas and put them out in the middle of their lawn and don't water them, and that usually doesn't work very well. They survive because they'll survive anything. In fact, one year I, I had some hostas I dug up and I didn't want them, so I chucked them into the woods just sitting on top of the soil. It's still there and it's still happy. It didn't kill it. Never buried it, never planted it, very shady, never gets watered, and it's still alive. Plants do like more sun or more shade, but in between works just fine. So most things will go just fine in part shade. Don't get too rattled about that. Wet and dry is important. We have plants that need to be dry, and if they're too wet, they'll rot. We have a lot of plants that like to be fairly dry and not too much water. We have some that want to sit right in the water. So it is important that you kind of match that. Don't go overboard on this. Just you want it approximately right. Wide beds. The, the classic perennial bed is a British garden design. And if you've ever gone to a larger garden and seen them, they're just fantastic. They're just full of stuff in here. Unfortunately, most of us can't afford that space, so we're, we're getting smaller and smaller all the time. But for perennials, wide beds look so much better than narrow beds. When you have a little bed that's you know, a foot and a half wide along the side of the house, you come along and say, well, what can I put in there? 
it's really hard to put something in there that looks great because there's no depth. You, you can kind of put one row of plants and that's it. And you want two or three rows of plants of different heights and different colors and different leaf shapes to give you a good look. Now the plant actually doesn't care. So this is all aesthetics. The plant's just happy in a bed that's one foot wide, as long as it has enough soil. Short to tall, so there's a, a gardening rule that you know you should never break. Small stuff goes in the front, tall stuff goes in the back, medium stuff goes in the middle, where else? And that's a rule that you should never follow. I mean, it's a pretty good rule. Many of these rules that you shouldn't break are actually good rules, but they're also rules that you should break. So, for instance, I have a, a, a pathway coming along here, and right here is a grass that I grow which goes about this tall, and it's right at the front. And it's great because people love to touch that plant. They can hardly help it when they're going by. So it's nice to see big stuff where you don't expect it. Again, the plants really don't care, but aesthetically, it's, it's nice to mix them. The other thing we have to think about is the fact that things only bloom two weeks. And for the most part, that's true. We get two weeks of color, and the rest of the time we get sort of greenish plants. So we want to design it so we have things going on all the time. So I like tall things and short things. I like something here that's blooming now and something there that's blooming later and mixing it up like that. The last thing is ugly plants. There are a lot of perennials that are perfect perennials, except that they're ugly. You might know bearded iris. It's got one of the most fabulous flowers there is in garden. They come in thousands of different colors. And after flowering, it is one of the ugliest plants you've ever seen. The leaves kind of go yellow. They usually get spots on them. You have to dig it up every three years because they get too crowded then they stop flowering, so it's a lot of work. They get the iris borer, so you have a pest problem. It's just a horrible plant, except for the fact that it makes really beautiful flowers. So we don't want any ugly plants. They only flower for two weeks, so we have to think about what this plant looks like for the rest of the year. That's really important in this plant. And again, this is very personal. So I do grow some things that will go ugly, and I put them in the middle of the bed so nobody sees them. Oriental poppies. They make fairly big flowers, really bright colors, mostly in the oranges and reds, but there's also some whites and some stripes and so on, some pinks. They're great right now. They're growing nice. The leaves are kind of interesting looking. The flowers are really fantastic. And then by late spring, the whole plant goes ugly. Like it just goes brown and they go underground and it's just an ugly plant. So the trick is don't put it at the, here where you walk. You put it in the back somewhere. So by the time it goes ugly, something else is blooming in front of it and you don't notice it. So what about maintenance? Perennials are pretty simple. I'm going to give you advice that nobody else is ever going to give you. Uh, so I don't know if you're going to believe me or not, but uh, pick up any perennial book, listen to any of the, the gardening gurus, and they'll tell you, oh, you've got to feed them every year, you've got to give them this, you've got to give them that. I grow about 3,000 different plants. I don't fertilize a thing. Vegetable garden is a little different. Containers are different because we water them so much, and we usually don't use soil in them. Now, I do mulch. I've got a lot of wood chips everywhere, and those are slowly decomposing and adding a bit of nutrients. And all of the plant material that's in there stays there, so I don't take things away. If I'm deadheading a flower and taking the old one off, I just throw it in there somewhere. If I'm pulling off an ugly leaf, I just throw it in there somewhere. Right now, if you come to my property, you'll see all last year's hostas because all the leaves are still sitting on the ground. And they'll stay there until they rot. So I'm not taking any nutrients away. From an aesthetic point of view, it's nicer that the leaves aren't there. That's why a lot of people will take them off and take them over here and compost them and then bring back the compost. And that works too. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you bring it back. Now the problem with feeding perennials is that a lot of these perennials have different kinds of fertilizer. Uh, you know, roses. Roses are really shrubs. Roses uh, take one kind. Your spring flowers take something different. Your bulbs take something different. We've got all these different categories, and they all have different fertilizers. I'm not sure why we have that, but that's what we have. They don't actually need different fertilizers. And then we have a whole bunch of perennials with, with no labels. Like we don't, you know, like a Monarda. What kind of fertilizer do you use with a Monarda? Well, Google that, and you'll get a bunch of different answers. Everybody has a different opinion as to how you should fertilize a Monarda. 
Well, part of the reason is that nobody's ever studied it. Nobody has taken these thousands of different perennials and figured out what's the best fertilizer for these plants. So we really don't know. So most people have a suggestion, well, you take 10, 10, 10, which is a balanced fertilizer, and you just kind of spread it around. Okay, around here we have lots of potassium, we have lots of phosphate. What it might need is some nitrogen, so you can throw some nitrogen around if you want. The other thing that happens with fertilizer is that if you feed them too much, you get weaker plants. They make a lot of lush growth. Some perennials, if you feed them too much, will make growth and not flower. You can over-fertilize. They, they like to be grown a little tough. All the perennials grow at a certain rate, and they're all a little different. Okay, I have a little violet. I've had it for 12 years. It came in this big, and I think it's this big now. And it's, it's quite a rare plant, that I, and it just won't grow. I wish it was spread out so I could split it up and give it to friends and stuff. Other plants, like Monarda, it's one of those ugly plants. It's a native. Hummingbirds love it. It's got great colored flowers. It does get mildew. We don't want any of that. But its biggest problem is it spread. Unless you have a spot where it can do that, or you're willing to come out every year and, and chop it back down to the size it's supposed to be, it's a lot of work. So most of the Monarda has been kicked out of my garden, although I love the flowers. Dividing is what you do when you come along and you take your clump and you cut it into smaller pieces. Most perennials actually don't need to be divided that much. So there are a couple that you do have to divide. Uh, the bearded iris we talked about. When a plant gets too crowded, it stops blooming. And that's the sign that says, do something with me. And then you usually go through a process and divide it up. As long as it's flowering and it's growing, leave it. Some never want to be divided. So peonies are good for 100 years. So when you do divide, uh, what a lot of people will do is dig the whole thing up, take it out, and then cut it into pieces. And that works. So I usually just use uh, shovels. I then use a spade, which is a, a, is a shovel with a flat end, and it's sharper. So I just literally cut it down into quarters or eighths or whatever I want, put one piece back in, the others go to friends, and you're done. The other way to do it, and I do this with newer plants or plants that I'm not sure how easy they divide, I'll take my spade and I'll cut it in half, take half out and leave the other half alone. Because when you dig the whole thing up, you're, you're cutting off all the roots, right? You're doing a tremendous amount of damage to this plant. Many plants are just fine with that. You can't hurt them. But if I'm kind of concerned about a plant, I'll just do half of it. Dig half out, and the other half doesn't get disturbed. So all its roots are going off in that direction. And they stay there. I don't cut them. I only cut the piece that I want out. And it's half the size. Uh, staking is something that the old-time perennial gardeners used to do a lot of. So you'd go through your garden every two or three weeks and you'd stake everything. Staking is one of those jobs that's actually very difficult. If you can see the stake when it's flowering, you haven't done it right. The biggest problem is most of us will wait until it's ready to flower and then try and stake it and it's too late. You have to start a month earlier and sort of train it as it's coming up and stake it and hide the stake and let the leaves grow around it. And if you do it right, you, you really can't tell that the stake's there unless someone's looking really close. Now, a much better option is don't grow anything that needs staking. And these days, we have that option because a lot of the perennials that they used to grow were kind of tall and spindly little things. And now we have cultivars that are much stronger. A lot of them are shorter, too, but they're, they're stiffer stems. So if we have something that, like the fall mums, the garden mums, not those things you buy in a pot in the fall, but real garden mums, they tend to grow up about this tall, but they kind of hang all over the place. They're not very neat looking in the fall. And they, they can use staking, but we have newer cultivars now that don't do that. They have stiffer stems, so they, they stand upright. Delphiniums is a fantastic plant, and it pretty much needs staking here. But you can buy delphiniums now that are only two feet tall, and they don't need the stake. Now, my personal opinion is that a two-foot-tall delphinium isn't really a delphinium. I grow delphiniums, which I stake. These are yuccas, which I have growing on the hill, and I usually stake them because these flower heads are big. And if I get a good wind coming through here, it'll topple them just as they're opening. Winter protection. This one's really quite simple. If you don't protect it in the winter, 
and it's dead in the spring, it's not a good perennial. Why fool around with something that can't make it through the winter? I don't protect anything in the wintertime. The best protection for perennials is snow. And unfortunately around here, we just don't get a reliable snow cover. But the trick is to grow things that grow here. And there are lots and lots of things that will grow and many things that won't. Uh, fall cleanup, don't do it. Uh, I know why you want to do it. Because first of all, everybody tells you you should do it. And that's the way it's been done for hundreds of years. Go through and clean up everything. You clean up all the leaves, everything that's dead. You cut it all back and you take it all to your compost pile and look and your garden looks really nice and neat. Problem is, those leaves are actually protecting the plant. So if you look at a hosta or a daylily, if you haven't touched it yet, go out and look at it. Last year's leaves are all laying right around the crown. Those leaves collect snow. So when we have a small amount of snow, it collects all around here. The leaves are also warming the plant. Above ground we're cold, but below ground we're warm because we have a big heater in the middle of the earth. And so the heat is constantly coming up to the surface and then it, it gets blown away. By putting anything on top, mulch, snow, leaves, we're adding a little bit of extra protection, a little bit of extra warmth for that plant. The other thing is that all the insects are living in all that stuff because they get overwinter somewhere too. So the lady beetles that are eating your aphids, they're overwintering in that. The native bees are inside little uh, stems, wherever they can find a place to hide. We have thousands of insects that need some place to hide, and we clean it all up, bag it, and send it to the city so they have no place to overwinter. And then next year we wonder why they're not in the garden helping us take care of the pests. And if you're worried about the insects, 9 out of 10 insects are good guys. So most of the insects that you're, you're protecting here are all good, good guys. So anyways, I do no fall cleanup. I do everything in the spring. I like to do my cleanup when the ground's still frozen because I don't want to compact the soil. We have a spring and the, the ground's thawed and you walk on it, you can feel the soil compressing. So it's much better to do that on a sunny day when it's still frozen. Go out and clean up your garden. Anything that's not on the ground, we cut off. If it's on the ground, just leave it. So I'm going along and there's a hostel flower stem from last year and I'm cutting it off. Daylily flower stems might be sticking up, I cut them off. But if it's on the ground, you just leave it on the ground. Now for aesthetic reasons, I know why you would want to clean it up and then compost it, but do it in the spring. So there's some other things that we can do for our perennials. We can cut them back uh, before flowering. So I mentioned these fall asters that grow about you know this tall. So one thing we can do is, is kind of fool them a little bit. So we come along here sometime in June, and they've now grown to about this height, and we cut them off. And what happens when we do that is that it starts initiating new buds. So you get more buds, you get a fuller plant, and you tend to get stronger stems. And by flowering time, the plant's not quite as tall. The other thing is we do some cutting back after flowering. So we have the poppy, looks really great in spring, nice green growth, comes up early, then it's going to make a really nice flower, and then it goes ugly. And what you do with uglies is you just cut them off. So there are a number of perennials that look much better if we cut them back. Most things you don't have to do that, but there are some that they, they seem to get to the middle of summer and they just kind of get exhausted. They've had their beauty moment, and if you cut them off, they usually will regrow and look good again. Deadheading is, is a little more important, I think. So deadheading is where we come along and we take a flower that's finished and we pull that flower off. Now, why would we do that? Well, one is aesthetics. Dried up flower is not pretty. The daylily aficionados, they will go out every morning and pull off every dead daylily flower. And there's a reason they're called daylily. Flower only lasts one day. So whatever was pretty yesterday is ugly today, and we pull them off. Well, not we, but my friends. But the plant does look nicer that way. Some flowers, when they die, you don't even notice it, like the geranium sanguinium. I'm not even sure what a dead flower looks like on it, because you don't. it just shrivels up and you don't see it. Other ones, they just look really ugly when they die, and, and they take away from the look of the rest of the plant. But there's a more important reason for doing that. Flowers are there for one reason. And believe it or not, it's not to make you happy. Okay, they're there to make seeds. 
it puts a lot of energy into those seeds. And I want my energy to go into the roots for a bigger plant next year, for more flowers next year. I don't really want a lot of seeds this year. That's one good reason to deadhead. So we take all these flowers off so they don't make seeds and the, the plant doesn't waste its energy. There's another reason is that some of these seeds can be very invasive. The, a lot of perennials, they'll make seeds and you just never notice it. Like you got one plant and five years from now you got one plant. Other perennials, you have one plant, five years from now you got like 200 of them. And not only just here, but over there and over there and over there. And the seeds get all over the place. And if it's something you don't really want or it's something that's really hard to dig out, you want to get rid of that seed head. If we look at the dandelion, for instance, it is a perennial. We try not to let it go to seed so we don't have a whole bunch of dandelion. The same thing happens with the favorite perennials in your garden. Alliums are, are uh, a good example. So alliums are onions. There are all kinds of ornamental onions, and some of them plant them. They're really pretty, nice plants. Five years later, like you got them like this, and it takes years to get rid of them. So you can come along and deadhead them, and then you won't get any seeds. I hope you enjoyed this introduction to perennials. If you have any further questions, please leave a comment below, and I will personally answer them for you. I'll be making more videos to show you some of my favorite perennials. When those are ready, I'll put a link to them in the top right-hand corner of the screen. Happy gardening!